So um, I'm going to get started. Um, so today we have Professor Sangbei Kim, who is a professor of mechanical engineering at MIT, and he is the director of the Biomimetic Robotics Lab. Um, he has a very impressive research history. Um, he created the, the world's first directional adhesive and used it um, to create a climbing robot. And this was all inspired by geckos. Time Magazine named him as one of the best inventions of 2006. Um, beyond this, he's developed the MIT Cheetah, which is another fascinating robot that can travel at very fast speeds. Um, he has earned several recognitions, um, many best paper awards. He was the DARPA Young he re recipient of the DARPA Young Faculty Award. He received uh, an NSF Career Award and the Ruth and Joel Spina Award for Distinguished Teaching. So today he's gonna to talk about um, robots with physical intelligence. And so with that, um, please remember to put your questions in the chat. I will call on you at the end. It would be great if you can remember your questions and I'll give you a prompt as to which question to ask if you've asked several. Um, and with that, let me uh, turn it over to Sengbei. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, thanks, thanks, Jen, uh, for introduction. Uh, this is Sangbei Kim. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. I've been uh, working at MIT about 12 years. Uh, yeah, it's about 12 years now. And then my career, my academic career is dedicated to robotics. So I know everybody's excited about robotics. So anybody excited about robotics? Raise your hand. Yay. And I, I'm, how many people like animals? I'm actually a big fan of both. I'm, I'm interested in uh, understanding how animal moves. Whoa, I see a lot of yellow hand. The, I'm interested in biomechanics uh, and biology and how animal works. And at the same time, I'm trying to compare that with the, our engineering uh, disciplines and how we build the robot. So that's basically centered around my research. And I will briefly show you what I've been working on the uh, last 12 years. At the same time, I would like to throw you uh, quite, uh, how can I say, challenging question. So might be, this is, might be uh, topics you might uh, work on in the future because it's quite far, uh, looking far forehead. So the title is Robots with the Physical Intelligence. What, the, what, is, what is the physical intelligence? Uh, this is something I just made up, uh, made up about four years ago. And then the, the word does, does by itself doesn't really mean uh, properly because we actually don't have enough languages to describe these kind of things. So hopefully at the end of the uh, talk, you have a little bit of better understanding uh, what I mean by physical intelligence. Hopefully in the future, we have a better term. All right, let's start. Um, as you know, most technology you are enjoying in your phones and uh, your, your laptops and, and all kinds of technology you're enjoying are actually, if you really think about it, those are dealing with the information, information only. You, I'm seeing your face, uh, you know, and I, you can hear my voice. Those are all just exchanging information. And then we are living this amazing uh, error where you can have a virtual seminar with the 300 people. It's amazing. Yes, uh, it's a, sometimes it's all on my head. Actually, I can do this uh, meeting with uh, all my cell phone. So IT technology has been uh, changing our lives. But at the same time, uh, we also need a different kind of services. And then this kind of service I call physical services that actually need uh, actual physical work. Uh, labor, basically. So that's why I call physical uh, intelligence. And then the intelligence that required to do this kind of service is very different from information services. So for example, uh, delivery, you, you can't deliver item with the uh, source of code uh, using your cell phone. You actually need to generate energy. You have to pick up a box and then to move uh, going over some trains and so on. Elderly care, it's, this is probably the most important topic, especially for your generation. The world population is growing rapidly in a, a senior uh, uh, age group. And thanks to all these medical uh, innovations and our uh, birth rate dropped very quickly. So in some future and se several decades later, we are gonna face uh, actual uh, labor shortage. 
we're not talking about labor shortage on like construction or, or uh, building products because those are relatively automated. We're talking about physical service at home, companionship, farming, construction, home security. You can think about all kinds of uh, service uh, work that you can just solve by just you know, sending a code in your cell phone. You actually need a person uh, or some automated machine. So uh, that's we are actually what we're going to talk about today. And then it's actually quite underdeveloped. Uh, you might wonder AI is taking over the world, and then it soon it's going to be smarter than us. If you if you're talking about the left, maybe. If you're talking about the right side, the physical services, we're not even close. So uh, I hope you uh, pay attention well, and then they might uh, shed some light on your early future career. And another interesting thing about this physical services. It requires mobility. Uh, cell phone, you carry all the time, but any of these services you can't solve uh, by uh, just buying stuck in the wall because any of the physical services require mobility. So that's why I actually, <coughs> excuse me, to start working on mobility. But anyway, uh, let's think about what are the automated uh, physical services we've been uh, utilizing. These are the factory robots this particular video is actually now is a few years old. It's from BMW. It's pretty amazing. Like you can lift the entire car chassis up and down and with a, like a sub millimeter accuracy. These are really precise machine. They never get tired. They, their repeatability is amazing. They do the same thing a million times without uh, failure. Somehow, if you go visit any factory, there are always people. It's seemingly a very easy job for us. Just plug in some soft uh, uh, cables, uh, yet the current robots actually cannot, uh, robots are not capable of doing this. The reason, a uh, simple uh, answer here, all these amazing robots are in factories are purely following some position uh, command. Go here, go there, open your jaw and then close your jaw and then move here, move here, there. There's actually no understanding of how hard this material is, how, uh, how hard I can push and so on. So when it comes to cable, cable is a floppy. And then you don't know exactly where it is without having very high level uh, precision camera and then very high end software. We are doing this all the time. Our, I, my, I'm moving my hand all the time, but my accuracy of my hand is not even close to those robots, but we have a much better uh, understanding of the world. And then I, I can grab things and then bend wire in a way that we want it. And then these robots actually don't have that kind of intelligence. So these are all uh, alluded to the physical intelligence terminology I was talking about. Um, we had an amazing competition uh, called the DARPA Robotics Challenge. It's 2015. Now it's like six years ago. But technology didn't change that much. And then you're watching actually the most exciting part of the entire five-day competition. And you might be wondering why these robots are so clumsy. Um, they have amazing software there, a lot of programming and brilliant engineers worked on it. The hardware uh, on this uh, robots actually are not that different from the hardware you saw in the previous uh, robot in the factories, because that's what we know. That's why we are so familiar with. So still a lot of robots are built uh, in a way that is the same way the manufacturing robots are built, where uh, the precision is a top priority. I want to really accurately plug this in so we can assemble things well, but they can do a million times well. That kind of uh, characteristic doesn't really go well with uh, moving around on the outside uh, environment, outside the factory, where there's uh, so much uncertainties. So I actually uh, blame uh, all these uh, failure, uh, uh, mostly hardware. I blame hardware for these failures. Uh, so these robots are not designed to do physical interactions, like a colliding or observing energy by landing uh, and when it landing. So if you think about animals, I mean, you can just watch yourself like standing up and down, walk around. But the, one of the extreme example, these are snow leopard chasing down mountain goat. Like the, sometimes the slope is like a 60 degree or 70 degree. And then they're not that accurate. These robots, the animals are not a, a sub millimeter, doesn't have a sub millimeter accuracy, but they're really good at something. You know, when you watch sports and uh, the weird like a football player or basketball player or tennis player, human seeming, you might think, oh, those are so accurate. 
compared to robot, we're not even close, but we're some we're much better at balancing and then absorbing shock and then react on some uh, unexpected event. So we are uh, we are built animals are built very, very differently from the manufacturing robot. So my career has been focusing on how can we change the robot design paradigm? I want to build a robot very different from this kind of robot in the factory because they cannot balance, they cannot apply forces. They are only uh, uh, they are the robot that does only the position following the position command. So they're also mo mostly on the on the fix on the ground, and then designed to work like this kind of picture, like just fix. And then when the car comes in, every position is known. Go there, weld, 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 and come back. If you want to uh, build a robot that operate in the in the field. That's not the case. We have to be able to move, our, move around and then you have to be able to react on unexpected environment. You need to be able to balance because you have to move, walk around and then you have to control the force rather than position. So I've been working on many different robots uh, thinking about these challenges. And I, I will show you a couple of examples. Uh, as Jen introduced, I actually worked on Sticky Bot, which is Gecko inspired climbing robot. This one actually had a, a the world first directional adhesive. Uh, I, I talk a lot of weird word, but the, this actually the sticky part of the pad work, works, works only one direction. That's why I call it directional adhesive. Uh, we actually coined this term. This, this, the term didn't exist. This concept didn't exist. Uh, well, actually, actually exists only in biology. We just didn't know about it. So the, the sticky part actually utilized that uh, characteristic and that's how it can actually climb up the wall without having trouble detaching the foot. Imagine you have a foot that's very, very sticky, like a double side tape. You're going to have, have a hard time detaching a foot from the wall. But if you look at sticky bar, it's a very weak machine, have no problem uh, detaching the foot from the wall because the adhesive works only one direction. I love to talk about this about our hour, but there's uh, other topics, so we'll move on. Yeah, that, this video is showing you're going to see soon. Uh, there's going to be a little delay. There's a little hair structure that only works in one direction. In, uh, in the real gecko case, those hairs are as small as about 100 nanometer. It's incredibly small. I also worked on cockroach inspired running robot. Uh, this is a slow motion uh, running on the treadmill. In the real speed, if you watch it, you don't un understand what's going on. It's uh, very fast. This is where I start. Uh, getting interested in uh, running robot and the running mechanics. Third robot I want to show you is uh, probably the strangest robot I will built. Uh, it's called the Mesh Worm. It's an earthworm inspired uh, robot that uses the same peristalsis, uh, peristaltic locomotion. Uh, ironically, that's actually the same mechanism how you move your foot inside your intestine. Uh, it's like a squeezing sequential squeezing motion that actually uh, make things move forward. And I stopped working on it because it's so light and so weak. So I don't, I couldn't find a way to use it. It was a very interesting scientific project, but uh, we move on to the cheetah robot where you can actually move around in human environment. You can climb upstairs and you can actually do some physical work. So this is a cheetah one. Uh, at the time, our controller wasn't very great, so robot has to be uh, be able to help. Uh, uh, we have actually hold a robot uh, in plane, but we were be able to test a lot of uh, uh, motor characteristics: like how speed, how fast it does it need to be, how powerful it has to be, and how energy efficient it is. It turns out that this robot was at all as as efficient as an animal, so that was very promising. And then allow us to develop uh, next generations. So I'll show you those in the next slide. Oh, after this. So the key idea uh, to make robot that moves around and then being dynamic is being able to absorb shock. Uh, compared to the robot you saw in the previous videos in the factories, those are very, very rigid and then cannot handle a shock. The details are a lot more complex. I ho hope you can uh, come to MIT or uh, go to the college and then learn more about robotics. But the uh, building robot that can absorb shock in this kind of high speed motion isn't actually, uh, wasn't very common. Uh, it wasn't very straightforward before we actually introduced this kind of concept. We're not actually the first one who uh, used this concept. There's other community like the haptic uh, community was using it, but we actually use for uh, leg robot. 
So that kind of characteristic uh, actually allow us to uh, build a robot like this. This is a Chira 2 that actually fastest robot we ever built. It actually ran up to six meters per second. It's uh, slightly faster than your jogging speed. Still not as fast as a real animal. You know, your cat or dog can be faster than this robot. But uh, by the time there's no robot, uh, especially powered by electric electricity, was be able to run like this. And this is probably the only one where we're the only one who did this, like a, a steep pull chase. Robot actually see the obstacle autonomously, uh, change the step, and then jump over obstacle and then land stably. So you have you see the little uh, black sensor in front of the robot, which is uh, called the lidar. You probably heard about it uh, if you read, read about uh, like autonomous car and stuff. So it's a laser sensor that detects the uh, uh, obstacles. This is Chira 3. Robots are getting a little uglier because it's a lot uh, less bio-inspired, but it's actually more functional. It can do, it become more versatile. So our design evolve uh, toward in a more robotic way, and then you can achieve uh, more robust, uh, more versatile functionality. This robot will be able to climb upstairs without vision. It was, this is all blind operation. It's not that I want to climb up blindly, uh, but we don't want to rely on a uh, camera only. We want to have some redundancy. That's why we were testing the algorithm. And thanks to our custom uh, developed electro electric motor, uh, this robot is very powerful. The last uh, robot I would like to show you is a mini cheetah. This is the, probably the most dynamic and then most uh, robust robot we ever built. Uh, thanks to its, uh, its size, this robot is almost indestructible. So this is the first version we built and then running in our lab for two years, we, we never had any mechanical failure. And a lot of people think it's cute. Uh, we actually bring this robot to the uh, Jimmy Fallon show. You can look it up, Jimmy Fallon show. And then we actually demonstrate in front of Jimmy Fallon. Uh, that was one of the uh, showbotics uh, issue in 2018 uh, or 19, I don't exactly remember. Uh, our software getting better and better. So our software has become more versatile. So we can uh, apply many different gates and we can uh, handle very large disturbances. So balance is actually uh, the center part of our research so far. And then being able to balance uh, while walking is actually very, very important and then it's been difficult. Now uh, we're showing off all kinds of behaviors because our thanks to our software development, And then uh, we're showing some extreme behavior that uh, no other robot uh, could show because our robots are actually built for that. We're, we're uh, not building something that precise and slow motion. We're actually built robot that can drop from the meter height, uh, from shoulder height and still absorb shock uh, and then still stabilize it. If you drop a robot uh, based on the manufacturing robot, as soon as it hit the ground, it's gonna break its gearbox. It's gonna break all kinds of parts but our robots are not uh, built that way. That's what I mean by the paradigm shift. We want to uh, change how robots are built in a way that this kind of mobile robot can be useful uh, in our life. And so far it doesn't have a camera, but still doesn't fall because uh, it's, a, it's an excellent balance controller. So you're gonna learn that the building hardware is important, but the software uh, eventually is gonna uh, is going to determine the performance of the robot. So now we have a camera. <clears throat> this is also a few years back. Uh, we have a, a depth sensor. It's a camera that can see the 3D. And then robots are automatically uh, choosing a step so that it doesn't uh, topple over the obstacle. You can avoid the obstacle, but also it chooses the right uh, location. And the obstacle is too high to walk over, we can jump over. So if you see the left top uh, corner, uh, you can see the blue or green and blues are the not good location to step on. And then greens are more flat. So those are good places to step on. So robots are automatically uh, look at the, the 3D map and then decide where to make your uh, move your foot. And then the red parts, red dots are the parts robots are seeing now. But the robot has a good memory. So you, you look at around and then you build a map and then, um, and then we uh, rec uh, mem memorize where it is. So even though you're not looking at the obstacle right under your feet, 
uh, you still remember where the obstacle was, you can still make a decision. Like you climbing up the stairs. When you climb upstairs, you're not looking at your photo all the time. You're looking at your friends and then saying hi, but somehow you don't trip because you remember where the step was and then your legs kind of know uh, where to step. Um, the, the key idea is actually uh, making a uh, robot, making the electric motor properly and then in very high bandwidth. So you're gonna learn about bandwidth when you go to college, but the uh, in a easy term is a fast reaction. I mean, the, fa the factory robots wasn't fast. The factory robots are really fast too, but they don't react fast. If you hammer it, if you hammer or touch it, they are uh, pretty much like moving sculpture, cannot absorb energy. And then whereas our robots are built such a special way, we built our own custom motor. We actually need to wind our coil, the first motors, and develop our electronics from scratch. And then now our robot can react so fast, uh, we can control the force within like a blink of the eye uh, time. So uh, if you look at the history, this is a very rough uh, summary of a robot, a leg robots. 2001, the Shimo, and if you look at the robots are uh, below the bar, these are all uh, hydraulic robots. Uh, a lot of them are Boson Dynamics, but some are from other uh, robots. And then initially hydraulic robots are really popular because hydraulics are very good at handling shocks. You know, excavators and then bulldozers, those are actually built for digging ground, handling shocks and impact. So it's very good for leg robot, but uh, its energy efficiency was really, really bad and then very hard to uh, control and build well. So uh, in the beginning, hydraulic machines are all dominating until MIT Shira show up. The, the red circle, red uh, rectangulars are all our robots. And then people realize, oh, electric motor actually can be really good. And then ever since 2016, there's no uh, hydraulic quadruped exists, only humanoid. Uh, you probably know the Atlas, but every, everybody else started working on electric quadruped, which is pretty much copied from our robot. So this is a, uh, in my opinion, pretty good achievement. I changed uh, how robots built and then show how electric power can be very powerful and then very good. Electric machines are actually a lot more uh, fast response and it can be very, very powerful. I will show you some of the more recent uh, update. Uh, our controller uh, will be able to jump a lot more uh, diverse way. You can uh, see the obstacle autonomously just jump over. And it's not only jumping forward, it's actually jump uh, to the diagonal direction to the side. Uh, our softwares are getting more uh, generalized. So we can actually uh, code uh, many different behavior much more easily. Before we had to write code for every specific behavior. Now we can write a code for a group of behaviors. So that's progress. Uh, so you're gonna learn about software later. Uh, it's very cumbersome to write every behavior uh, and then, because whenever you want to do something new, you have to rewrite the code. But we're actually getting better and better at uh, uh, writing code that can do many different things. I'll show you a different type of jumping, uh, for example. Let me show this part. Spin, you can jump and spin mixed together. So these are all coded uh, in the same way. So you can specify how many, how much you wanna spin, how, which direction you wanna jump, and specify it and the robot figure out how to do it. So uh, you can see just jumping and turning or jumping and rolling. So those are all automatically coded. So I don't need to write code for each behaviors. So now it's ready to uh, con connect with the camera and then let the robot figure out where to go and then jumping and mixing jumping and running and so on. And I wanna show you briefly how robot actually figure out where to go. Uh, and the, if you see the left most picture, uh, robot camera will see the map, this 3D map. And then they uh, figure out which part is more flat. They, they classify it. This is a flat, this is the obstacle I don't wanna go. This is possibly a place I can step on and so on. And then create a trajectory, the third picture. Uh, this is a goal, this is where I am. And draw a line straight uh, first. But they soon realize robot want to have some safety margin. So we modify the trajectory to be more safe. And then you create, based on the trajectory, you create that kind of a safety boundary. So 
we're doing this kind of like a trajectory planning in real time. So even though robot sees something unexpected, it can adjust uh, its trajectory right away. So I'll show you that quickly. So this picture is a demonstrating, this video is a demonstrating uh, the goal is behind the a box, the Pelican case, and still know where to go. And then robot has to turn to see the goal location because this is an un, uh, unseen environment. So you, robot has to be able to adapt. And next video is like human uh, students are actually jumping in. He's actually undergrad, uh, so we'll see. Walking, he jump in in the, in the middle and the robot automatically notice and then turn around. It's a little bit slow, but uh, we can tune to make it robot faster soon. And you will see how happy our student is. So uh, he's an undergrad, uh, so he's been working on our lab for many years and really happy to see this autonomous behavior by his code. I want to briefly talk about uh, teleoperation. So far, you've seen a lot of development of the leg robot moving around, jumping around obstacle, and so on. But when it comes to moving hands, as I said in the beginning, uh, the physical intelligence is not there yet. So we're uh, thinking about using some human intelligence for now. So this is a, a, a teleoperation demo in, done in our lab. Uh, you can't quite feel the things I'm feeling, but I'm actually feeling the force that the, the left robot is feeling. So right, right robot, I'm, the, you see my hand is manipulating uh, my left robot just through the wire. So these are not physically connected, it's all, all through the program, but I can actually feel the force. Not only I can control the robot, so if you develop this kind of technology in the future, we can possibly uh, provide some services. Um, I'll, uh, I'll skip the detail. This is actually a force a contact sensor we were developing. And uh, thanks to our uh, a fast uh, robot arm and our contact sensor, we can do this kind of uh, magic demo. I, we call that as a virtual magnet. Um, you know, obviously the wood wouldn't get attracted to rubber, uh, but this is all program. You know, once the develop technologies are developed uh, far enough, you can distinguish from the magic or you might heard something like that, right? We write a program in a way that uh, rubbers are attracted to wood, but these are all force feedback controlled uh, system uh, that we developed and then write a code. And this is not easy to achieve because you need a very special force sensor uh, sensor and you need a very special robotic arm. Those are all developed by our labs. So at this point, we're the only group in the world can demonstrate something like this. So we'll soon our robot will have a very good sensor in the tip so it can be a lot more sensitive and then reactive. Um, I wanna show you one quick uh, demonstration of uh, apple picking, but possibly boringly, this is actually done by me. So I'll show you. Did you see that? I'll show you one more time. That was pretty quick. Have you seen it? There's some delay, me picking an apple. I'll show you just one more time because there's, there's gonna be some delay. So that's a picking an apple. Everybody can do it, right? But have you seen your hand, what hand your hand is doing? If you see step by step, it's pretty remarkable. First of all, I was, I was picking an apple blindly. I'm not actually looking at it. I'm just like reaching out to the ball and then picking an apple. So my hand just collide with the apple. And you can see that if you write on code, if you know everything, you probably want to pick an apple uh, that the hand touches, the top two probably. But somehow my hand uh, just tried to grab right away, hit something, tried to grasp and then it turns out that I uh, happen to touch more apples than two. I happen to touch like five apples and somehow choose to grab something the hardest. This is not happening all the time, but it happens sometimes. And then you realize it's, there's a lot of apple piled up. So I need to move my hand uh, digging in more to grasp that apple. Let's go in deeper and then bring it out. It is pretty successful grasp. But if you take a look at individual decision making, it's pretty dumb. It's not very smart. My hands are very, my, not very smart. 
I'm blaming. Look at look at me. I'm blaming my hand, not blaming me. Uh, but I I you know claim that that's a fair enough because I actually didn't know what my hand is doing. Try it. If you try to pick up any object in your hand in the in the front of your desk, and then you look seems like you're controlling every bit of your hand. Yes, I'm controlling every bit of my finger. But when you do something, just bring out a, a key keychain from your pocket. Try something like that. Do you remember any action you did by doing it? The bottom line is you're sitting in the chairman's chair in the company. You're like sitting in the CEO's chair and then ask your company, oh, develop a product. And then something magically happened. And your hands or your fingers are doing a lot of little detail work. There's a lot of complicated algorithm going on. We don't even know quite. And then suddenly done, so I don't care about it. But there's a lot of detail, uh, complex behavior happening and not all of them are not necessarily optimal. Uh, you're gonna learn about optimal uh, control in the later. I mean, you've, you see the, my uh, behavior of picking an apple. Individual actions are not very good, yet overall performance is pretty robust because there's some common sense going on. We are not even close to write a code, programming, write programming code for uh, robotics yet. Uh, not even a single behavior like this. Every robot is still very clumsy and very quiet. This is uh, things uh, I'm talking about physical intelligence. Like peanut butter jelly sandwich. Uh, who cannot, who can, like anybody can like learn and then write a peanut butter, uh, make a peanut butter sandwich to spread the, you know, the peanut butter on the bread. How difficult is that? Just think about the word spread is a very, very vague word, a very abstract. If you think about write a code for robotics, uh, robotic system to do this, we have absolutely no clue. So a lot of actions and a lot of language we're using are not quite uh, programming ready. That's exactly what's going on in the physical world. It's not really true in the digital world where the information is moving uh, in the exchange. We're very well defined. Our pictures are defined by pixels. Our voices are defined by uh, uh, the, 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 the data, voice data. When it comes to physical actions and forces and bendings and squeezing, you don't, you don't even have proper language. You cannot easily uh, digitize this and then communicate with the computer. That's why you don't see robot doing some uh, dishwashing. This is probably one of the extreme version of dishwashing. You know, in the in the restaurant, you have to wash really quickly. This is unbelievable how quickly human can do. Again, you have to see the slow motion to see any detail action and what it does. And you're gonna soon realize he's not, he never even have a second is holding the tray. It's almost like a skiing around the tray. Two hands are like skimming and sliding. And somehow it kind of like rub on almost every surface within a second or two. And how would you even write a code? Because their positions are not defined, forces are not defined. Humans are following some abstract uh, concept to achieve something like a cleaning tray. Cleaning tray is very vague. So in order to really uh, uh, write a program, a robot to do this kind of stuff, we need to be able to write uh, languages, not only human language, also uh, robotic languages to translate this to computer world, which were not, uh, lacking, we're not having it at all. You probably uh, think about like, you know, program that can beat like human chess player or Go player. Wow, that's amazing intelligence. But you don't think about uh, writing a code for picking out a keychain from your pocket. You don't think that's intelligence because that's a, a small kids can do it. Some animal can do it. But that might be wrong because the level of intelligence in this level, in this area, are very self-conscious for you. When you do movement of each chest movement, you have to think about every action. When you grab, grab up keychain from your pocket, these are completely unconscious part of it, subconscious part of it. And then we uh, tend to underestimate them. So bottom line is we as a human tend to judge the level of difficulties of certain, certain tasks based on what we are good at, which is very, very different from <clears throat> what the robots are good at. So I want you to think about this kind of stuff. And then if you want to learn more about, there are actually an uh, article I wrote and just published this today in IEEE Spectrum. So you can find in the uh, chat window. 
and then you're going to have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So uh, to summarize, because time's already uh, 12, 12, uh, 110. Uh, uh, first, leg ro robots are becoming more important. They can be used for a lot of autonomous tasks, you see. The moving around is getting better and better. Uh, and then the actuation, the, the development of electric motors that uh, geared toward leg robot was very important uh, to make this kind of robot possible and then very diverse, uh, the versatile. But the physical skills, uh, the hand skill, uh, are uh, heavily rely on the subconscious action. So you don't really understand. You don't even quite uh, remember even. So in order to build the robot like that, we need to understand how human is doing, partially, probably. But also, we need to be able to write a code that can understand this very abstract action, not just like controlling x, y, z, move here 10 centimeter, move forward 20 centimeter. That kind of uh, control uh, programming is not going to help us to uh, build a robot that can do the dishwashing or even cleaning the house. So uh, it might be very confusing, but I want you to start thinking about any actions you're doing by hand and then uh, think about how much do you actually remember? How much do you actually recognize? You probably you might be surprised how little you're actually involved uh, on your, your side of the story, your side of controlling hand. And then when it comes to robotics, that part, the subconscious part, uh, the hand skills are very underdeveloped. We're not, we're far from uh, achieving this kind of task. So uh, with that, I would like to finish my talk and then uh, we'll move on to the Q&A. So thank you for your attention. And then let's talk about any more detail. If you have any. All right, thank you. We have a, a whole bunch of questions. Maybe we'll start with Zachary. He had a question on how to prepare for a career. Uh, that you're that you're pursuing. Uh, yeah. Hi. So I was just wondering, like, what you would recommend studying in college for someone who wants to do robotics, kind of like you have. Um. Good question. I think the I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of the coding. So the programming and coding is becoming like a language. Becoming it is called a language, and then it's like a you know English speaking. When you're young, when you're younger, you learn how to read. Oh, reading is so important because that's how you communicate from people who wrote knowledge on the book. And uh, programming, I'm not actually a very good programmer because I grew up in the different era. I was a mechanical engineer uh, and my students are doing most of programming right nowadays. But uh, it's becoming like a very essential uh, language. So if you don't write program, uh, you, you, uh, you lack of this communication skill. Uh, you don't necessarily need to be the best programmer in the world, but this is, you know, you don't need to be the best speakers. You don't need to be, you know, uh, like uh, Obama, like you, you don't need to be the best speaker in the world, but you need to speak languages you can communicate with people. So that's pretty much uh, the coding uh, and the programming skill you need to have. Uh, and, you know, it's a language, so it's earlier the better. So I encourage you to just jump into programming as a hobby. Uh, it's like exercise, you know, so I need to prepare for the future. It's like a muscle. Um, other than that, I want you to really start thinking about physics. You know, physics is something also takes quite a long time to uh, get used to. I mean, physics, pr physics lecture might be boring, uh, depends on teacher, but physics are fantastic. Physics are, you know, phenomena is all happening in your, in your world and then understanding it. If you don't quite understand physics as a concept, no matter how good you are in programming, you can write a code for robotics because, you, you know, your, your robots are doing physical actions. If you want to just write a code for a computer, cell phones and a laptop, fine, you don't need to understand physics. But I think those areas are very well developed. By the time you guys are grow up and then getting a job, I think that kind of actions, uh, the worlds are already uh, light ahead, uh, ahead of you. The things I'm talking about today is though a chance uh, to really make a difference. And then that's where uh, the technologies are very lacking. And then I uh, talk about a few reasons why these are underdeveloped. First of all, we don't quite understand. In order to understand, we need to understand the physics. Um, the machine learning actually allow us to do these things without understanding physics. So some of the things are probably we need to rely on machine learning without understanding physics, but uh, I still think under, without understand, actually human understanding writing code is actually a very dangerous idea. You've probably seen uh, many examples. I can talk about it if you have any specific example. So I would say physics, programming. All right, thank you. 
Well, I cannot miss out math because mathematics are a type of language. So, you know, that's just obvious. I, I, I trust that everybody th already know math is important that you probably heard so many times. So I just skip that. Okay, so that, that's great. Um, Ashida, you have um, a question on how this involves um, this research involves other disciplines. And yeah, so I was wondering that, like you mentioned that there was like, you were looking after animals for your inspiration. So I was wondering how much of your work intersected with fields like zoology and biology. And did you learn anything from those scientists, which is like kind of a different mindset than engineering and like- Yes. The different mindset, that was actually a really important word. You, you picked the right word. So I, I was the one who like, you know, promoting like learn from animal. We, there's a, you know, gazillions of uh, like billions of years of knowledge accumulated. We just need to discover. It turns out that applying those knowledge directly to engineering world was very difficult. It's not that I never had it. I had a, you know, a few successful example, but the, uh, the amount of time you invested in the biology, uh, the, the, Things you can utilize in engineering world is becoming uh, the uh, the investment to return is not very good, but that's like that could be actually wrong uh, because of the mindset you just talked about. You know, if I look at individual things, like if I study muscle, if I know everything about uh, human muscle, can I build a better actuator? The chances are very slim, but if you study and understand biology better, your mindset and perspective is completely changed. So uh, it's hard to even describe because uh, uh, the, I, the, the things I, that I feel uh, in changing my brain is very abstract level. Like I actually became a lot more humble, first of all. More I study about biology, I became a lot more humble. Uh, what I mean by humble as an engineer is like uh, there are some group of people who doesn't study biology. They think the mathematics and then the, the physics or uh, programming they learn Many people are more like an anchor to the mathematics. And then they think that's the world, that's everything. And then that's very narrow-minded and very dangerous mindset. Once you start studying biology and then you soon realize, oh, this mathematics is a, a very small fraction of the uh, things that, that, this, that can describe the world because the mathematics is what human created. Yes, it's a great tool. And then, um, but it's very, uh, a narrow uh, point of view perspective. Uh, it, it, it's a language that describes the war, how the world works, but the mathematics that can describe only a fraction of what's going on in the world. That's why I think the studying biology actually uh, allow you to see the world completely differently, I think. Make you uh, see the world in a much wider perspective. So I, I, I'm glad that you talked about this. And so that's why I still think it's worth studying biology, even though they are night and day sometimes, many times, uh, uh, it, it really changes how you see things differently and then make, you, uh, make your brain more flexible. That might be the uh, easiest way to think about it. Make your brain a lot more flexible and then make you a uh, more wide thinker, like not narrow-minded. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll definitely keep that in mind as I yes. go to my engineering career. <clears throat> sure thing. Um, Ethan, you had a question about bipeds versus quadrupeds. Yeah, so I've seen many robots that are bipedal, and I'm just wondering what benefit do we get on researching bipedal robots over quadrupedal robots? Because it seems like it would just be a lot harder to get to work in balance and whatnot. You're, you're absolutely right. And then this is actually the question I got uh, when I was interviewing for uh, MIT professor job. And then I was completely fumble because it was, uh, first of all, it's very difficult question to think about. And then this has been debated uh, over in academia over many decades. And so my answer might, might, might not be simple, but you're absolutely right. The biped is a lot more difficult to balance because you have just two legs. And if you look at the uh, biology, um, biology there, right? Uh, there are only a handful of animals are biped, like a bunch of birds who, you know, I mean, the most birds can walk on biped, but they're not the excellent, most, the best uh, biped, but there are ostriches, for example, they never fly. So, and then human. And then the most of other animals are actually quadruped. 
and then we believe that there's a reason why reason behind there quadrupeds are a lot easier a lot more versatile it actually can be more agile yet uh, if you think about why human evolved to be biped and then i believe that uh, it free up the hands so now you can actually run with the spear and then throw at it instead of you have to chase down and then you have to bite or, or scratch you know, that's a completely different level of uh, your skill uh, so if you think about that's a biological perspective but if you think about our like our world a human like a service robot in the human world Sim kind of similar uh, uh, problem happened. Quadrupeds are fantastic moving around. It's mo so much easier to build and then uh, build a robot controller stable. But in order to think about, in order to reach something, because we want the robot to service in our own environment. I have a, something in the kitchen cabinet or even bookshelf. I want to reach something. And the quadruped has to be quite massive to attach another arm to reach bookshelf. Whereas a humanoid can be much narrower, much smaller, much lighter, still can reach high. Just think about yourself and compare with the biggest dog you've ever seen, Malamute or Siberian Husky. They had a hard time reaching anything because they're almost as heavy as us. So same thing happened in robotics too. But you don't want the robot to be too big that's servicing in our house. So, and, and another challenge like uh, going in a narrow space, you know, Four-legged animal cannot fit in small space. Human can be fit in very small space because we're upright. Of course, there's challenges, but so that kind of like pros and cons are uh, happening in between uh, biped and quadruped. Uh, so still, still under de uh, uh, debating like what is better form factor for future robot. Who knows? Uh, we don't know. Three leg. We don't need to stick on the animal, right? Hey, Amanda, are you ready? Yep. Um, so hello, Mr. Kim. Um, it's very nice to meet you. Um, my nice question you. was, how often do you use AI and reinforcement learning in training the robot to do tasks, um, assuming you use them at all? So uh, we use very minimally so far. And uh, honestly, I've been uh, for a while, a few years, been skeptical about physical, like a dynamic work. But apparently, uh, machine learning can actually do a, a lot of those, even like balancing and climbing stairs kind of thing can be done by machine learning itself. Uh, we actually use machine learning for much smaller tasks, like uh, mapping uh, some sensor. The fourth sensor I briefly show you actually use a, a training by machine learning uh, to uh, supervise learning uh, to do that. There's actually in reinforced learning and supervised learning is very different. There's a, a lot more different terminology. We all call this as machine learning. And AI is a lot more vague terminology. Uh, but the most machine, if you say machine learning, uh, that automatically means you're uh, using data training, as you said. Uh, we're relying on training rather than hand coding. Uh, it, it actually can do things much better and easier, faster way than uh, com compared to what we've been doing. That's kind of like a loophole you can fall into uh, if you just fall in love with the mathematics only. Because sometimes the mathematical formulation is not the best way to uh, represent certain phenomena. It's a kind of detour. Whereas machine learning neural network can just connect much more intuitively quickly. The problem of uh, machine learning though is we cannot quite understand the, uh, the, the neural network uh, is, is formed. We can manipulate the uh, data. We can manipulate what kind of algorithm we're using to form a neural network, but we cannot directly control um, the thinking of that neural network. You know, it's a reflex. But uh, so if you throw too many tasks in, in, in the one neural network, it's going to be very difficult to tune in the right direction. So that's why, uh, you know, I think it's better to keep this neural network or machine learning to be relatively isolated task. Uh, when it comes to more complex tasks, we have to do this at the same time, do this. And then you want to fine tune all these so that we can, you know, for example, keep it safe or, uh, and so on. There, that's where you might want to uh, write a code differently. So you can actually tune this parameter properly. Because if you write a, a more traditional way, uh, you can actually tune the parameter in real time. You can see in a second or a half second. In the machine learning, if you change it, you have to retrain the whole thing. 
So we might have to wait at least a couple of hours, sometimes a couple of days to see what your change is. So it's gonna be very difficult to uh, move toward uh, a, a certain direction. So that kind of debate is still going on and then still uh, answers are changing. The, the people's perspective change and so on. So we'll see, but so far we don't quite understand the, how the machine learning uh, is doing the abstraction. So still the academia is cut in half, like some halves are uh, believing machine learning is gonna change the world. The other half is still being skeptical and people like me, I think it's going to be some hybrid, some mixture of the mathematics driven, modeling based driven code mix, uh, coupled with the machine learning. Thank you. That was very insightful. Okay, so maybe one last question. Um, KG, do you have a, you had a question about some of the future applications? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Oh, thank you for the amazing presentation. I was wondering, what do you think are the most exciting applications of physical intelligent robots? Um, the things I talked about, uh, you know, construction uh, and then farming delivery, uh, but it, it, you know, a lot of people want the robot to clean their room because we're lazy. I don't think that's actually most exciting in my opinion, because I rather, I think we should be more uh, physically active. But uh, elderly care is a different story. So I'm, I'm mostly excited about the elderly care. There's a lot of little things, like even the vacuuming on the floor or organizing things, the delivering a cup of water. Some of uh, the elderly population, they cannot even move. They have some spine issue, some leg issue. And then once you lose that mobility, you absolutely need some physical uh, service. But think about every person who has some mobility issue, you have to somebody living in the house to serve, provide service. It's not gonna be very useful. So we want to have uh, some robotic agent uh, to help something and then possibly teleoperate by somebody else uh, through the internet. But that person cannot control every single detail action through the internet. So the robot need to have uh, some good physical intelligence. They can do manual work. And the human is only uh, making high level decision. Okay, let's go to the uh, refrigerator to get a cup of water. Uh, and a cup is from here, refrigerator, or the water from here, and things like that. But the handling the object, I think, has to be done by robot by itself because the internet has a limited bandwidth, too. Okay, I like one more question. <laughs> if we can just sneak one more in. Um, uh, Grace, you had a question on um, the design process. Oh, oh yeah. Um, so, Hi, uh, first off, thank you for your talk. And it was like super interesting and insightful. And I guess like for a bit of context in my question, um, I'm in the assistive tech course and we kind of focus more on designing the product for our co-designers to help alleviate some of the issues they may face with completing certain tasks. So in particular, I was wondering how your design process looks like and with these like robots and how do you get started with these projects and I guess, like, how does your timeline look like with such large scale projects? Honestly, I have to confess that I, uh, uh, if I look back how I developed robots, the process was missing. I actually want to enforce more process. I'm actually teaching a class that does this. Uh, uh, it's called the 2007. It's a, it's a over 30 year old, a very famous uh, long lasting class. They teach you how to design process. Robotics, uh, the problem of robotics is the, we are designing something always very different from the previous one. So it's very hard to apply some design process. Uh, if, I, if I really show you like a performance graph over time, it's more like this, nothing happened for six months. And then on one revolution or one good conversation, one week, amazing work, and then nothing happened. And then at some point you have to make a decision, should I just build or should I just wait another six months? Hopefully something happened to my brain. That, that kind of thing happened a lot. Um, we're actually designing humanoid right now. And I, I've been designing really fast during pandemic for three months. And then I got stuck on something. I didn't even know sometimes what I'm stuck with. And then I didn't do anything for four months, five months. And then at some point you it, it, fall, it fall into this like uh, same patterns of brain. I look at the parts and then my brain goes same way. 
So never improve anything. So at some point, I, I grabbed my student and said, okay, I'm done. You design it now. And then he brings his completely different uh, fresh perspective. Even though he's seen what I'm designing, it's a very different mindset if you actually take ownership. And then he actually improved quite a bit and then make changes that I couldn't make changes. So uh, it's a very interesting, like it's very difficult to have a code design, like three people meet together all the time design. That not, doesn't necessarily work. Uh, and then, oh, you design arm, I design leg, I design body. That also not necessarily wasn't work well. I think sometimes you have to actually, I design scratch and then toss somebody, you design and then toss back and forth or three per third person. Uh, because the, the, especially robot design is very difficult because there's a lot of moving parts, which is very different from designing a table. You know, even a car, you know, car has only two degree freedom. So everything else is pretty much like a structural design. Robotics are crazy complex. They're like a 10 degree freedom. Uh, and then there's a lot of way to reroute to even wire. So uh, it's been pretty difficult to apply design process. But I think, I, I confess that we need to have a more processes. And then maybe next year, if you see me again, I might have a better answer. <laughs> Let's yeah. put it that way. <laughs> thank you. Okay, somebody, thank you so much for, for being here today. At this time, I'd like to um, ask Kitty and Andreas to unmute your, um, your mics and present our speaker with a little thank you. Sure, so thank you so much, Professor Kim, for presenting to us today about your really fascinating work with uh, work with biomimetic robotics and also um, dynamic physical intelligence. Personally, I've always enjoyed watching YouTube videos featuring the MIT cheetah robots, and I'm sure many of my peers share the same sentiments. So learning a bit more about the logistics of just shock absorption, uh, proprioceptive force control, and automatous, uh, sorry, mobility um, behind this field of robotics today has just been really incredibly enlightening. Um, so as a token of our appreciation and gratitude, we would just like to present you with a virtual BWSI t-shirt. Yay, thank you. Thank you for your, actually, uh, I already received this, so I'm already wearing it. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Bob, like give it back to me, yep. Great. Thank you so much. And students, we will see you tomorrow for, um, for our next installment of the seminar. And Sungbae, thanks again so much. This was a really- Thank you. 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 Thank you.